and I tested the big TV just now. It does work, so we should be okay. Well, it's not jumping out of me, so I'm okay, going to go without it. Good afternoon. Home stretch. <laughs> Defense counsel said that they're not denying that Hannah was abused. There's no denial that Hannah was abused. Yet they're offering several different options as to what would amount to reasonable doubt and other explanations for her injuries, including a fall on the ice, <coughs> fall from a toy a day before. So that is a denial of abuse. But even when they say they're not denying the abuse, They also acknowledge that all of the visible injuries, those injuries that were seen by the EMTs, by the emergency room doctors, by the Cincinnati Children's Doctors, those that were immediately concerning, the eye, the chest, the chin, those, those were all things that happened while Hannah was in the care of this defendant. Those were all bruises that this defendant says that she can adequately explain. And yet the experts in the field, the experts in child abuse, say those explanations just don't cut it. And then she goes on to say, well, yeah, I said that those injuries were there, but if they look worse, that must mean that somebody else said something else in the exact same spot that I said it was caused by this accident. According to defense and their expert, the only explanation for Hannah's death is this bruise on the back of her head. But I submit to you that you heard from Dr. Young, Dr. Cray, Dr. Makaroff, Dr. Dean, and they all told you that that is not the only explanation for her death. And that what she died from was abusive head trauma. And they repeatedly described to you what abusive head trauma is. They can't say specifically in each point in time what mechanism caused the injury because who do they have to rely on to say that? The person that caused the injury. So they rely on their knowledge and their understanding of how victims present. Cases in which they've had confirmations of the mechanism of injury. And they tell you that the injuries that Hannah Washi had were absolutely consistent with abusive head trauma. Shaking, shaking with impact or multiple impacts. They say Jason must have caused these injuries. If she's abused, then it's Jason. Jason's the one that caused these injuries. But somehow in all of this, with Jason being the one to cause the injuries, this defendant steps up and says it was me. And I never heard her say at any point that Jason told her to go ahead and tell them that you shook her. They were trying to explain, according to her, the external visible injuries. The shaking isn't an external visible injury. Yet, she provided the shaking mechanism and she, the defendant, volunteered that. 
She is the first to have brought that up. <clears throat> if that's the case, if this is all that Jason told her to just go ahead, you know, this will make it easier. Nothing's really going to happen. Just tell them. And I'll back you up. That it was okay for you to discipline the child. Why does she spend an hour denying it in that second interview? When they push her and push her, why isn't she saying, oh, yeah, you know, I, I didn't feel comfortable. I wasn't sure what I was allowed to say. But, you know, Jason and I have always had this agreement that I could discipline her. In fact, he wants me to keep her in check because she gets into trouble. And she's mischievous. And this defendant describes Hannah as mischievous in her very first interview on March 8th. Defense counsel argues that Lindsay is the focus of this prosecution and is even subject to falsified testimony by Detective Lambert, all because the Butler County Sheriff's Office must get a conviction of Lindsay Parton. Doesn't make sense. Does make sense that Detective Lambert is new, was a new detective. She fell apart on the stand. And she made a very poor decision. And I'm not saying that that's at all excusable and you should expect and demand more when law enforcement is testifying. But if the sheriff's office were involved in this, and this was all a big collusion to somehow set her up, why then have Detective Turner come in and point it out directly to you? Let you know absolutely 100% that that testimony was not correct. You don't think he could have come in and said, well, I looked at the computer and it looks like she'd made it back in March 9th of 2018. We were able to verify that. But he comes in here and he tells you exactly what he found out. And the claim that Detective Turner was somehow doing something wrong when he told Jason Weshey on Monday morning of this week, I don't want to hear anything more. If you recall, will recall, we left Friday with Detective Turner on the stand. Come back Monday, Detective Turner on the stand. You've heard the judge admonish witnesses about talking to anybody. I can't hear this, I gotta walk away. He's following the court's order. Ms. Howard wants you to believe that, you know what? Lindsay confessed. Everybody's high-fiving out in the hallway. We're done. Close the case. Signing up. Hey, you're a lead detective now. Good for you. And yes, they asked questions specifically about did you pull Jason's phone records? Did you take his phone? Did you take the phone of the father who was sitting in ICU at Cincinnati Children's Hospital sitting by the side of his dying daughter? Did you take his phone? Did you take his phone when you had the babysitter telling you exactly what she did to that child? Did you go ahead and take his phone? Did you go out and find out where he was that night and everywhere he'd been because he was wrong about Walmart? What they didn't, what you never heard asked, is what did you do to fully investigate Jason? That was never asked. And Jason is absolutely odd. And he, I'm sure, most people, at first glance, look at him and say, yeah, he can do it. Because isn't that what we do as human beings? 
We see people, we judge people from the outside. Look at them and just follow our preconceived notions. I would expect that Jason Weshey would be suspect number one. He's the single dad, working 12 hours a day. And look at his house. <coughs> the police were talking to him multiple times, too. The police are talking to him while his daughter, or shortly after his daughter, has just undergone brain surgery. They're not ignoring him. And no doubt about it, Jason should have recognized the signs of abuse. Absolutely as a parent. Anybody who's been around children, you see those pictures. You see what that child looked like. And you know what you're seeing. But Jason didn't. And I'm sure he kicks himself every day for not doing that. That every time he got an explanation when Hannah came home from the babysitter, every time she had a new bruise, why didn't he push harder? He didn't go get milk. He now remembers a year later where he went because a friend told him. Who knows if that's true? I mean, not saying his friend didn't tell him, but again, we're talking about a year later. Is it possible days are confused? Absolutely. But as we go through this, I submit to you that that's not going to matter. I want you to believe that he somehow abused this child, that he caused her death because she only has a few ratty dolls in her playroom and a big box. I think anybody with any experience with children recognizes that it takes almost nothing. We spend so much money on toys and they're happy with a ratty old doll and a cardboard box. And his morning routine may have been hazy. Working 12 hours a day, falling asleep on the couch, wake up at 6, getting out the door. He thought he fed her cereal. He didn't see cereal in the picture. Those mornings get so hazy. I'm sure he wishes he had just a few moments of that, those last minutes back. Maybe he would have slowed down and paid a little closer attention. But we all forget to do that at times. He continued to say it was an aneurysm, despite being told that it was abuse. The part that was missing and the arguments you heard from defense was the, the part where Lindsay told him, can you believe those police officers had lied to me and told me they had to die? Can you believe that? So why wouldn't he believe that they would lie to him about abuse? And he's sitting there saying, I know I didn't do this. And I'm trusting this woman, this woman that I had given my child to, four days a week for almost a year now. I'm trusting her when she tells me she didn't do it. So there must be some other explanation. What I don't understand is why she would believe that. Because she had spent four hours in an interrogation where she was repeatedly told it was somebody. Somebody hurt this child. You heard about some maybe ill-advised charitable 
things that he's tried to do on behalf, the GoFundMe accounts that he's tried to do in honor of his daughter, and a lawsuit that he filed due to medical bills. And there was a question regarding applying for Medicare or Medicaid. But applying for that doesn't mean you get it. And if this were a get rich quick scheme, I guess, if that's what that is, he what, planned his daughter's death all in the hopes of this defendant would somehow confess and now he's got it made. He did this and just got lucky that she confessed. That was a close one for him, wasn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a lot of conversations about phone records, and you're going to have them. You have the entirety to go through. And you can go through what you choose to go through. You can type in search terms. I believe Ms. Sheehan showed you how you can go along the left-hand side and click specific parts. But I invite you to do that. The defense would have you believe that this defendant is a patsy, I think is the word that was used. You don't see that in the text messages. You absolutely see a woman who knows what she wants, demands what she wants, and doesn't back down. I suggest to you that this defendant had a guilty conscience on March 8th. And I invite you to listen to her first inter interview. At the time marker of 5430 through 5434, you can turn it all the way up. And this is before Detective Whitlock or Sergeant Whitlock has ever come into the room. Janae, Detective Lambert leaves, calls her honey, and within that time stamp, I submit that you hear this defendant say, I'm going to prison for the rest of my life. She knows on March 8th that this is because of something she did. And we don't need to go on and on about the Google searches, but timing is key. And truly, if it hadn't been deleted regarding how to get rid of a bruise, I don't think it'd be a question. But why that one when you left everything else? Because that one sounds bad. Or at least she thinks it might. You heard testimony from Paula. I've heard no reason, no motive for Paula to lie. She says she cleaned the house. You know she was there about a half an hour. That's probably why clothes are piled on the bed. She didn't say she scoured it and bleached it and swept it. She rushed around trying to clean the house. She had 30 minutes to do it. There's no reason for Paula, who has been friends with the defendant, close to the defendant. And you can see the thousands of pages of messages back and forth. They're confidants. There's no reason for her to come in here and lie about this defendant. Ladies and gentlemen, I also submit to you that this defendant is the only one who knew about the bruises to the back of Hannah Weshey's head. <coughs> no one saw the bruising when they first saw her, saw Hannah. The radiologist did note in her record
I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the screen. It's page 4520 from State's Exhibit 8. Did look, note in line 6, and as she talked about to you in her testimony, the extracranial soft tissue swelling, which indicates some sort of a bruise there. She saw that that day. But nobody else saw it, not until the head was shaved. But on that day, March 8th of 2018, in her initial interview, she's asked all about what kind of bruises have you seen, and have you seen bruises anywhere on her head? Yeah. Well, where? Sometimes on the back. Have you ever asked her about the bruises on her head? No, I would just say, did you fall? Did you jump off the couch again? She only ever gave Hannah explanations for those bruises. Never asked for explanations from Hannah. I submit to you that this defendant knew about those bruises to the back of the head before anybody else did because she had caused them. And at that moment in time, she wasn't aware that they didn't know that those were there. She claimed she had no idea police would lie to her like that. She trusted police. And yet, by March 9th, she absolutely knew that they couldn't be trusted. She absolutely knew because they'd lied to her about Hannah being dead. And if she knew that, and she knew police as well as she says she did, then she also would have known that they would do anything within the bounds of the law to find out who killed Hannah. That they would search until they found out who killed Hannah. And Lindsay had every right to walk away from that interview. Both days, multiple times, you can see that. Don't tell me she didn't feel like she could go anywhere. Over and over again, her rights were read to her. She was told, you are free to leave at any time. But she stayed. <coughs> Lindsay's testimony from yesterday is somewhat the most confusing to me. She's both saying what de de detectives are telling her she needs to say, has to say, telling them what they want her, want her to say, but also telling them what Jason wants her to say. <clears throat> it doesn't comport. And most importantly, and we'll come back to the medical experts from the state, but I submit to you the evidence that you heard from Dr. Perret, Dr. Dean, Dr. Makarov. All entirely consistent with this child would not have been acting normal following the injury. She would not have been walking, talking, asking for donuts. They are all confident. Dr. Perret, when pushed, on cross-examination, saying the world doesn't work like that, we need time. She gave an answer of within seconds. Lindsay describes in detail, in detail in her first interview, exactly what Hannah did. She describes opening the door and Hannah walking in in front of her. Hannah turning and looking at her and saying, donuts, couch buddy, and then taking off her coat and just collapsing.
So even if you took out and for some reason believed that the part when she told the detectives how she heard Hannah was all fa false, that that was all a false <coughs> confession, at some point in that second interview she started to lie to get herself in trouble. She still puts herself exactly in that time frame. Exactly in that time frame. And you, unfortunately, have two weeks of testimony. And you collectively have to decide what you heard. But I heard from this stand, and I can't recall if it was Dr. Gray or Dr. Makarov, who very specifically said, we have to go back to the last time she was normal. That's how we make that determination. And the last <coughs> time Hannah was normal was with her, with this defendant. And she spent a whole lot of time describing just how normal Hannah was. I tell you, I submit to you that what this defendant actually did was effectively ensure that justice, if you believe her, if you believe her from yesterday, saying I went in and I told the detectives all lies about what I did to him, it was all a lie. I told them what they wanted to hear, I told them what Jason wanted me to tell them, it was all a lie. <coughs> There's one person that she was absolutely not protecting. That one person is Hannah Weshi. If you believe that and what she said on the stand, then what she did was effectively prevent justice from ever happening for Hannah Weshi. If you believe that that's what she did, We've talked about Dr. Werner Spitz. Ladies and gentlemen, I know he, he's, his is probably the most fresh in your mind, but I want to point out some very significant things from what Dr. Spitz told you. He testified he didn't even review all the records. And in his cross-examination, it became apparent there was a whole lot of important information that he didn't even look at. He didn't even know. And based on his testimony, he what, had the case for maybe a week before he issued his opinion? I submit to you, and we'll go through, that his testimony was repeatedly contradicted by the autopsy report, by the medical records, <coughs> and even his own textbook. The textbook that he writes, the textbook that I would agree is absolutely an incredible authority. And he's very proud of it. But as we go through this, you will see that his testimony went against his own book. Why put it in a textbook if it's not true? This is a textbook relied upon by everybody in the field, essentially, as he described it. Anybody, pathologists, anybody that works in this type of field. And you'll hear an instruction from the judge regarding a learned treatise. And in that instruction it says that you have received evidence from learned treatises, i.e. writings by Dr. Makarov and Dr. Spitz, 
If believed, you may receive this evidence as the same as testimony and admitted documents. So those portions of the books or those writings that were read into evidence, those may absolutely be considered by you as evidence. So let's go through what he said. And I'm going to try to take it slow. And I know that you're tired and it's been a long day, but this medical evidence is important. And so I think we need to address it carefully. He spent a lot of time in his direct te testimony talking about the bruise on the back of the head. That picture that we saw with the red dot in the middle, and he talks about it being larger than life, and I'll absolutely agree, and I tell you when we put it up on the screen there, it's larger than life, but that's the whole reason for the scale, so that you can compare it with what it would actually be in a real size. We talked about, showed you with the skull, how that impact occurs, and that nothing else can really be determined as a bruise. It's just blood draining, the gravity causing the blood draining from her surgery that she had. And I came back to him, and I said, well, doctor, isn't it true that as a pathologist, the only way to really identify and determine whether it's a bruise or you're seeing that blood has drained is to look for crushed tissue. And his response was, well, yeah, I guess if you wanted to cut open the skin and look at that, you could. So then I showed him that we had States Exhibit 76 and 79, and you heard Dr. Dean talk about this. And I made him read from the coroner's report, States Exhibit 71, where Dr. Dean specifically noted four, four bruises externally that traveled all the way, I'm sorry, two bruises externally that traveled all the way through into that subgaleal, that tissue portion of the head, crushed tissue, an additional two separate subgaleal hemorrhages once she opened up the skin in the back. Four. Four separate areas of crushed tissue. That's four separate impacts. He spent a lot of time talking to you about brain swelling. And he described how, yeah, you can't really tell anything because of brain swelling, it causes additional injury. And I actually followed up and said, so because of brain swelling, it's hard to tell when you look at the brain, it's probably important to go back and look at all the medical records. And he agreed. And then he said, well, because it's swollen, it's going to be a mess and mushy, and there's no way slides could be made, so you can't really look at it. Well, then I confronted him with the very fact that slides were made, and that he hadn't seen them, and he hadn't asked for them. And his response was, I don't need to see those. I know what I would see. But you heard from Dr. Dean and you'll see within her report that she absolutely noted injury from swelling and noted additional hemorrhage. And the doctor even went on and described how those hemorrhages can look different. The difference between this, the hemorrhages from swelling and the hemorrhages from injury. But he never even looked at the slides. He didn't care enough. Even if you agree with Dr. Spitz that, you know, maybe, maybe that is just too questionable with the brain swelling, how is she going to see injury? How is she going to see hemorrhages? I mean, they didn't see it on the CT scan, but Dr. Cray told you 
how much more sensitive an MRI is and how much more they would be able to be able to see from that, but that they couldn't do that because of the precarious position of Hanawashi. But what he didn't talk about was anything about the examination of the posterior neck. The hemorrhages that were seen and the nerve fibers, the spinal cord hemorrhages. He talked about brainstem injury. He didn't talk about that. And Dr. Dean told you that that shows you, that shows you the tremendous force that went through this child. <clears throat> went through that area of this child. Submit to you that these were either missed entirely or they were ignored because they didn't comport with his minimal force opinion. When confronted with the optic nerve sheath hemorrhages, and asked about force. He claimed initially that this, these optic nerve sheath hemorrhages could be caused by this minimal force impact that he's talked about repeatedly, how that wasn't much force to the back of the head because you don't see enough injury there. But it was enough to cause this. And I came back to him specifically from his textbook and quoted that hemorrhages within the optic nerve are practically indicative of shaking. He said, well, yeah, it can be shaking too. Conversation about coup and contra coup, the injuries. And I specifically addressed that with Dr. Spitz. And again, I read to him from his book that many experts believe that aggressive shaking of an infant itself can cause death. Evidence in support of this opinion includes witness accounts and detailed confessions in which shaking without impact is described. It is generally accepted that the presence of an impact site partially depends on the nature of the impacting surface. Also, infants do not typically show the characteristic contra coup contusions that are seen in adults who sustain a scalp impact. And he agreed that it is not uncommon for a young brain to not show a coup and counter, counter coup, counter coup, I'll say it right, counter coup injury. He agreed that that's true. And yet he wants you to find that that's significant, that she didn't have that kind of injury, when he knows that you shouldn't expect that in a young child. He puts that in his own book. There's no skull fracture. There's never been an alleged skull fracture. Absolutely agree. Yet there was a very large subdural. And he didn't even know it. He went on and on about this wasn't that forceful. And you know why? Because there's only 40 mLs of a hemorrhage removed from her brain at autopsy. Only 40 milliliters. That's not significant. That's not sufficient enough. And then he talked a little bit about the hemicraniectomy and I finally asked him, doctor, why'd Hannah have that? I guess to remove the subdural, if, if there was a subdural, all right, I know they put in a pressure monitor, okay? Doctor, are you aware? Did you review those surgical notes? Are you aware of what they found? Are you aware of the subdural hemorrhage? Where they found 250 milliliters? I was not. That's a lot. Page 119 from State's Exhibit 8. And you have all of Cincinnati Children's Medical Records. Again, you can search for those, search through them. There is a page that will tell you how to access those. You do have to put in a password, but you are welcome to review those. And you can find notes 
from I think all of the doctors that we had except for Dr. Dean um, within the medical records. Dr. Dean's report would be separate. 250 milliliters estimated blood loss. This is just the brief procedure note showing date of service 3 8 of 2018, 1140. Right sided decompressive hemicraniectomy. No drain nor ICP monitor left. Multiple hemorrhagic cortical veins found and controlled. Closure was difficult with persistently herniating brain. Scalp closed with multiple full thickness interrupt interrupted and running nylon sutures. Right there. Dr. Spitz tried to tell you that those are staples. They're not. They're sutures. Page 105. Here's where you get the full detail. Here is exactly where Dr. Spitz, if he was doing his job, should have gone. If he wants to know what the injury is that caused this child's death, this surgical note is absolutely it. Procedures performed, emergent right-sided decompressive hemicraniectomy with evacuation of acute subdural <clears throat> hematoma. Estimated blood loss, approximately 250 milliliters. Upon arrival, it was seen that her neurological exam had declined such that now her left pupil was also fixed and dilated. <clears throat> Talks about, within those records, the 10, millim 10 millimeters of midline shift, the midline shift of her brain due to that subdural hematoma. Scissors were used to open the dura quickly in a wide, cruciate fashion. There was immediate egress of first trapped cerebrospinal fluid, followed very quickly by dark liquid blood and clot under very high pressure. This was carefully and gently but quickly evacuated with suction. We continued to evacuate the significant hematoma while we attempted to localize the active areas of hemorrhage that were the source of hematoma. We identified one large vein on the cortical surface high in the posterior fr frontal lobe as it bridged to join the superior sagittal sinus. I asked the doctor about that and he started telling me about clotting. They found an active bleed, two veins actually severed, that they had to repair while doing brain surgery. It also states the doctor who was evacuating the subdural hematoma, he got a look at the brain. He actually saw the brain. And he addresses it right here in these records. Says the underlying drain, I submit to you that if you review these records, you can tell that drain should be brain. It's a type of graphical error, but that's up to you to determine. But that it was seen to be significantly injured as it was pale in color throughout the hemisphere and non pulsatile. I asked Dr. Spitz, that means there's no pulse getting to it. it, means there's no blood getting to there. He also talked about the swelling didn't seem that severe here. He wouldn't expect, I mean, what he saw 10 days later, that wasn't that much of a swelling. So that couldn't be that significant of a brain injury. He said that multiple times. However, this note tells you just how bad that swelling was. And you saw it in the CT scans and those images that Dr. Hooray gave you. But it says here, at this time, I'm sorry, as the hematoma had been evacuated, the significant underlying edema, swelling, in the brain caused it to begin to herniate out of our craniectomy defect. At this time, our intention had been to place an intracranial pressure monitor into the injured frontal lobe. <coughs> However, there were two reasons why it became apparent we could not proceed with this as planned. First, the patient's hemodynamic st stability had begun to deteriorate. And further, the extent of her traumatic brain injury was so severe <coughs> that the brain was herniating significantly out of the cranial defect, despite no evidence of any additional sources of hemorrhage. 
they're operating on her and her brain is swelling outside of the hole they just created in the skull. I think that's significant, brain swelling. Specifically, and I know I mentioned this, that Dr. Spitz said there was swelling, but it was not severe. The way I recalled him stating it was that if this brain is subjected to a severe blow or a severe injury, the brain will be swollen more than what I convinced myself occurred in this case. Well, if you didn't look at the records, and you're convincing yourself with a brain that you saw 10 days later, that might be pretty easy. Even if you didn't see those surgical records, the CT scans show that brain swelling, show just how significant it is. Again, just the statement, the findings from Dr. Perret, from State's Exhibit 8, tell him of the mass effect, the midline shift of everything that is going on in that brain. And if he had taken the time to look at that, he would have known. Based on his testimony, submit to you that Piersy looked at the autopsy pictures. Maybe some of the report, of the coroner's report, but he had to be reminded of things within there. And I submit to you that the subdural hematoma, a subdural hemorrhage, sign of a diffuse brain injury that was absolutely the cause of the death of this child. And I read to him from page 1022, diffuse brain injury results in widespread global disruption of brain function, such as confusion, amnesia, or loss of consciousness. These injuries can be produced without an impact, although impacts often complicate these events and augment the forces of acceleration and deceleration. Subdural hematoma is a diffuse brain injury because it can be produced without an impact and often the removal of the hematoma fails to improve the patient's condition, reflecting the additional diffuse brain injury that accompanies the subdural hemorrhage. They evacuated that and it didn't do any good. And so lucid interval. Ms. Howard said that Dr. Dean or Dr. Spitz is the only person that talked about lucid interval, but if you'll recall, Dr. Dean was handed an excerpt from Dr. Spitz's book. And between the two of them, I think you got all the information you need to know about lucid interval. And I read the secondary portion after he read his first to him as well there. So at this point, you've heard it twice. And that is, a lucid interval is the time between injury and the development of neurologic symptoms. Some pediatric injuries are associated with immediate neurological symptoms, while other head trauma is associated with a lucid interval of variable duration. The likelihood of having a lucid interval depends primarily on the amount of sheer injury to the brain and the region of the brain that sustains the injury, in addition to other factors such as the presence of a <coughs> subdural or epidural hematoma 
traumatic axonal injury in the brain stem or spinal cord, and brain swelling. In 80% of children with head trauma, symptoms occur within one hour following injury. Head injuries in young children that result from sheer forces to the brain causing DAI are generally not associated with a lucid interval, especially if severe neurologic injury or death results. This includes infants and young children who are victims of shaken baby impact in parentheses syndrome. Neurologic symptoms that are typically associated with traumatic axonal injury from shearing include an immediate decrease in the level of consciousness, seizure activity, respiratory irregular irregularities and apnea. So you have the diffuse brain injury as we've already talked about that subdural hematoma. In addition you have this defendant's statements that her decrease in consciousness was immediate. This wasn't a she stumbled in, she was off balance, she was vomiting, she was normal and down. That's just not possible based on this. Dr. Spitz's book, which I read to him, also tells you about those shearing forces. That the most common pathophysiological element, meaning what causes something, in the production of the subdural hemorrhage is sudden acceleration and or deceleration of the skull relative to the brain. This results in the stretching and laceration of the veins that bridge the subdural space. Tearing of the bridging blood vessels involves angular or rotational acceleration and deceleration in the sagittal plane, and veins involved are those entering the superior sagittal sinus. And if you look at that surgical record, that's exactly where they found the vein. And that acceleration and deceleration of the brain within the head can absolutely you seen by shaking. And if that acceleration and deceleration happens in front of a door, in front of a couch, and causes the back of the head to also hit one of those, it makes it even worse. <clears throat> you can also see, in addition to everything that his book says, everything that we've heard about subdural hemorrhage, her progression from the moment the EMT saw her tell you exactly what this timing is. States Exhibit 1, the EMT record. They first arrive and her blood pressure is high and you heard Dr. Makarov say that is high for a young child. Her blood pressure is high for a young child but it quickly begins to drop. And by the time she's at Fort Hamilton Hospital, it's pretty steadily dropping. And they intubate. And you see the progression of the pupils. That it starts initially that they're sluggish. And then one, the right side, becomes non-reactive. And by the time they get to Cincinnati Children's Hospital, Eight fifty seven AM. One hour fifty seven minutes. Both of her pupils are fully dilated, non reactive. And you go back and look at these times. Look at the progression and how that's changing. Look at what happens in the less than fifteen minutes between the two vitals taking that the EMTs did. Look at what Fort Hamilton saw when she arrived by 745. A rapid, rapid change, not only in pupils, not only in heart rate, but in her Glasgow coma scale and her response. By the time she was at Cincinnati Children's, she started at 11 with the EMTs. She was at a five or six.
You've heard about the hepatitis C. And again, it's your memories that are important about what you heard. But I heard Dr. Makarov explain it pretty thoroughly regarding the hepatitis C. I think she was asked that couldn't, isn't there an antiviral medication that creates a platelet it, issue that can then show up as sensitivity to bruising? And she said she didn't have a platelet issue. We checked her blood, and there was no platelet issue. There is no explanation for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that Dr. Spitz's testimony is not reliable and not that of the quality on which you should rely. And I submit to you, let me rephrase that. I asked him specifically, Doctor, in your review of the records, did you feel like everything <coughs> you needed, you had everything you needed to review? And he said, Yes. Is there anything missing? Anything you thought you needed more time for? Anything you thought you should have had that you didn't? And his response was, I did meet with counsel. And if there were things I wanted to know, then he would have told me. He received the file beginning in March. And by March 8th, had rendered his opinion. And there was nothing he felt he needed to further make a determination. And the most important of your own affairs, is that something on which you would rely? Let me just explain how ludicrous, ludicrous this is. Did I object this time? Mm -hmm. I know this was raised, uh, I don't know, a few moments ago. I don't remember exactly how long ago. Uh, there may have been a suggestion that I believe was unintended, but it may have come across this way, that an acquittal in this case could, in essence, be tantamount to helping defendant accomplish obstruction of justice. I, I don't believe that was the spirit in which it was intended. I think the wording may have been a little confusing, and therefore I am instructing you that if you picked up on that, you are not to interpret that statement in that fashion. You are not permitted to do that. That is not a consideration you are allowed to have, okay? Uh, otherwise, uh, Ms. Hiley, if you want to resume uh, based on the conversations that we just had with that last statement. I think where I was was to suggest how ludicrous it would be to rely on Dr. Spitz's testimony. Imagine your strike that person laying in a bed ready for surgery. Doctor comes in and tells that person, hi, I'm your surgeon. I'm an expert. I wrote a book on it. Not sure I'll follow it today, but I know a lot about this kind of stuff. By the way, since I know so much about surgery, I don't really need to look at any of your other medical records. I'll just look at your body and I'll figure it out. I know what to do. And if you're concerned about that, don't worry, because I brought along an attorney who's going to tell me if there's something that I need to know. It's ridiculous. Again, talking about timeline, talking about is there enough time. Ladies and gentlemen, you sat through that one minute and 27 seconds. Not long enough to me. What if it's 30 more seconds? How about one more minute? Long enough? Lindsay told detectives on March 8th of 2018 that when she got a hold of Jason, he was at his truck. So why are we now changing that? Because that, at least according to them, is when she was telling the truth that first day. They want to shrink that time frame as much as possible. Defense would have you believe that the doctors in this case colluded. That they decided, you know what, we're going to work with the state. We've kind of committed to this. 
let's go for it. We're all going to come to an agreement that this was abused and that the time frame has to be super short and we'll get a conviction. Doctors who are renowned in their fields, doctors who are experts at what they do, doctors who continuously and continually practice at Cincinnati Children's on a daily basis would somehow throw out whatever ethical obligation they have for this? It's not reasonable. Ladies and gentlemen, it's up to you to decide which doctors, which experts, on which you would rely. You have a lot of evidence to go through. You have a number of recordings to go through. I don't expect at any point in time that this is an easy task. It's not. And I am sure you will be forever changed. And I expect that you will take this seriously. Not only for this defendant, but for Hannah Weshey as well. And we ask that you return verdicts of guilty. Thank you. Ms. Hiley, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one more thing ask you all to just kind of talk to some of yourselves about your families and the weather, nothing related to this case yet at this point. Next up, from my perspective, is I'm going to give you jury instructions and then we're going to get to work. Uh, Ms. Wilson and I need to address the logistics with these folks to see if they plan on hanging around or if maybe they'd like me to take a short break so they can pack off and meet their deadlines and get out of Dodge, okay? Talk so much yourselves, Ms. Wilson, let's confound with our friends from Corpus State.